sure many uh, North Dakotans on uh, Saturday and Sunday probably had a chance to connect with family uh, or get out uh, into the country and see North Dakota. I know I had a great uh, uh, Saturday, Sunday in the Badlands. So to all the friends and neighbors in Slope County, uh, great to see everybody at Spring Branding. And as uh, Ronald Reagan famously said one time, there's nothing better for the inside of a man than the outside of a horse. Uh, and so uh, uh, <coughs> great, great to be with everybody and uh, great to see North Dakota hard at work. Uh, yesterday, Memorial Day, uh, the day that we take a pause as a country and reflect on the freedoms that make our country great and on the tremendous individual sacrifices that those uh, brave men and women have given. Uh, made that ultimate sacrifice to help defend the freedoms in our way of life. I want to thank uh, the North Dakota National Guard, North Dakota Veterans Cemetery, uh, and all of those uh, individuals that were there participating uh, in the event uh, yesterday. Uh, it, it was a fantastic. We had a flyover by uh, North Dakota Air National Guard uh, helicopters, the Blackhawks, and uh, and just a great ceremony all around. If you missed it uh, because of something going on, you can watch the whole ceremony at the North Dakota National Guard Facebook page. Uh, go check it out. But again, thanks to everybody for uh, doing such a great job yesterday in, a, in this new, in the new uh, world we're living in to honor those individuals who fought for the freedoms that we still fight for today. The fight for freedom never ends, and we're re reminded of that yesterday. Uh, one of the things that... Uh, <clears throat> Some things have changed, uh, but one thing has remained constant throughout this, and that's that our faith in the people of North Dakota to exercise personal responsibility and look out for the well-being of their fellow citizens and neighbors. Uh, at the beginning of this month, back on May 1st, uh, we uh, were among we were among the states that closed down the least, and we were among the nations that opened up the first. Uh, and it's exciting to to see and observe uh, how people are exercising personal responsibility and at the same time looking out for the well-being of their fellow citizens and neighbors, particularly those that may be vulnerable uh, to COVID-19. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> As we continue to manage the risk of COVID-19, as we work to return towards normalcy, uh, again, we remind ourselves that this response that we had, uh, this pause, if you will, the stepping back was to give us time to build up our resources and capacity for testing and contact tracing, make sure we had adequate hospital capacity. Uh, we have built up testing and contact tracing. We do have adequate hospital capacity. At this, at this point, we're still only using about 2% of hospital capacity. And so again, we continue to move forward uh, with confidence both in our health care providers and in our ability to, to track and contain this disease to give everybody more confidence in our state that we can continue to keep adding more activity back, more transmissible moments back into our economy. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to go through some numbers today. Today, the Department of Health confirmed 43 additional cases out of 976 tests. Uh, I'm only going to spend a minute on this because this represents a relatively lower day because these are the tests for the 24-hour period for the holiday uh, Monday. What I would like to jump to is just take a look at the tests for the whole weekend. So this would represent tests from Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And we had a strong weekend of testing. Uh, uh, nearly, uh, it's about over 1,900 on average per day testing, close to 2,000. And of the 186 positive cases this weekend out of nearly 8,000 tests, a 2.4% positive rate over those four, uh, for over those four days. And so uh, again, uh, Great weekend of keeping the testing going uh, for over the weekend, uh, and that's a very positive thing because the virus wasn't going to take the weekend off, and it's great that all of the people in our healthcare system and the labs uh, also kept on working over the weekend to help us stay on top of this. When we take a look at serial testing, uh, the this again is this concept we've introduced a couple weeks ago, which is that we will be uh, testing some people for a second time uh, or possibly a third time. This can happen. If if you are someone who's in a long-term care facility where there's positives have been detected, or if you work in healthcare, uh, it's very, very possible that working in healthcare uh, would would could lead to getting tested multiple times. And and so again, uh, for yesterday, that lower day Monday, this is just the, the numbers for yesterday. You see the 976 tests, but of those, 437 were were repeats. 
When we take a look at the net case uh, breakdown, uh, currently we've got 40 hospitalized. That's one less uh, than uh, we had uh, the day before. And again, in terms of recovered cases, we've now crossed the 1700 uh, level in terms of, of, of that. And then the recovery number, there's 150 recoveries reported today. Uh, and that is, uh, again, in part because over the long weekend, the team had an opportunity to update case records and confirm Confirm that individuals who had recovered in the past uh, needed to be marked as recovered uh, and then therefore added to the dashboard. So there's a little bit of catch up on the, uh, the recoveds, but that would be why our number of active cases actually dropped uh, because we had more, more recovered than, than new uh, reported uh, yesterday. In, in terms of uh, the next topic, I want to talk a little bit about a, a challenge that we had last week and how we overcame it at the, uh, the lab. Uh, as we've often been saying throughout this since the beginning for months, testing is key. And if we can identify the positive cases, then we can and, and do effective uh, tracing. Uh, we can isolate and reduce and slow the spread of this. And that's the way uh, with good contact tracing and good testing, good contact tracing and good isolation, that's the way that we can be in a very targeted way, uh, we can make sure that we're controlling the spread, but still have our economy open. Uh, and so these things go hand in hand. The, the better we are at testing and tracing and isolating, uh, the more rapidly we can take what might be an ember and put it out quickly before it turns into a real fire. And it's uh, more with more confidence we can open up our entire economy. And North Dakota's health, Department of Health State Labs done a fantastic job increasing their capacity. As you see, uh, we've been close to 2,000 a day even over the weekend. This week, we've got two new Panther machines coming online. Each of those will be capable of running a 1,000 tests a day. So our goal here is to still to get to uh, being able to do f at the state lab 4,000 tests a day. We've got other labs that are also contributing uh, from the private sector, but the state lab uh, We'll, if the Panther machines come online on schedule this week, uh, we'll be at that 4,000 goal. All in all, since the beginning of this, the state lab has added 15 pieces of lab equipment. They've gone uh, to operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and there are over 100 new team members that are contributing to this effort. And of course, this has been an enormous, uh, enormous uh, team effort to build this capability and we're building this capability not just to deal with this, the pandemic right now but also to support faster economic recovery because we know the private sector uh, we know that schools we know that stadiums we know there's going to be increased demand for testing in the future and building up this testing capacity is one thing that's essential to us uh, returning to full economic activity uh, anyone that's ever worked uh, in or near a lab or anybody who's worked in any kind of complex, uh, highly automated uh 21st century manufacturing business understands that in con complex processes that equipment issues are part of the process. That's one of the things that people have to learn to deal with. Uh, one of the most important things is uh, to identify issues early and correct them as quickly as possible. Last week there was a testing machine malfunction uh, and it impacted tests that were processed Tuesday through Thursday. Uh, this was identified uh, by the staff because of the uh, good practices that they have in terms of having uh, control uh, tests that go through. And when they found some errors in the uh, a negative control came back positive, it came back so it was something they knew was supposed to come back as a negative, it came back as a positive. That was as often called a false positive. Um, they were able to go back and, and uh, really diagnose and troubleshoot uh, this problem. This is not an easy or simple to identify, but the state lab, the, the team put the pieces together quickly uh, and they made the, dis the correct decision to err on the side of caution and retest those samples. And so out of this abundance of caution, all the positive tests uh, from two machines, uh, Tuesday through Thursday, were considered inconclusive. Uh, 82 individuals were invited to retest. A team uh, worked over the weekend. They notified 27 different medical providers providers uh, and those medical providers uh, uh, contacted the individuals that were affected, arranged for retesting, delivered test kits, picked up samples, and were grateful to our local healthcare organizations and their partnership for getting these 82 individuals uh, retested uh, quickly. Uh, to date, uh, we've got 60 uh, 
five of those 81 tests, and I said 82 because uh, uh, one individual has opted to not be retested, but is instead choosing to be just self-isolating at home, and so that will be marked uh, as inconclusive for reporting purposes, but of the 65 retests, uh, only one remained positive, 64 were negative, and so those, uh, those will those have been updated and taken out of the positive count, uh, so we were overstating our positives by uh, some uh, last week. But again, remember we've done uh, over 80,000 tests uh, in the state. One percent of those uh, would be 800. This is 82, so this is one tenth of one percent of tests uh, that we've had a uh, equipment malfunction error uh, discovered quickly. Uh, I do want to say uh, again apologies to those individuals, the 82 individuals who got a positive test who, who when we get done with the last uh, 15 of these may find out that they were uh that they were they were all negative. So again, I know that the getting a call and saying you're positive for this can be uh, challenging and traumatic. So again, we're, accuracy is of the utmost importance to us at the state of North Dakota. Trust is the utmost important in terms of the work we're doing. And so again, our apologies uh, to you, uh, it, those individuals. Uh, equipment malfunction did not impact any processing over the weekend. The issue had been corrected by the time we got into the weekend. And again, I wanna thank all of those those people that have worked on the retesting. I want to thank those people who quickly identified that we may be getting some false positives. Uh, and I want to again thank all the local providers that helped us get everybody back and retested. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite to the podium uh, our lab director, Dr. Christy Mason. She's going to talk a little bit more about testing and why we've got strong confidence in our lab results. So Christy, thanks for being here. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, there are a lot of factors that help us determine the accuracy of PCR tests. And in ideal conditions, they are considered to be the gold standard test. Accuracy is impacted not only by the instrument and reagents used to perform the test, but also by the timing, the quality of specimen, and the biology of the individual. Because the PCR tests detect RNA that is specific for SARS-CoV-2, the specificity of the nucleic acid test for COVID-19 is very high. What we do know is that the manufacturer of the equipment and supplies have been leaders in the field for a long time. They are credible and reliable. We also have a lab full of critical thinkers who excel in what they do. The highest standards in the laboratory science world are being met every day. But now let's talk a little bit about asymptomatic cases and their impact on testing. Typically the test result is just one piece of the puzzle that the physician will use to diagnose a patient. But because there is a high symptomatic rate for COVID-19 and because symptoms are so varied among each individual, it's more complicated because you can't just take that positive test and confirm it with their clinical picture to have a better confidence in that diagnosis. Also, the asymptomatic rate in North Dakota is about 30%, and according to the CDC, this aligns with the national asymptomatic rate, which has an average of about 35%. This is why it continues to be very important to follow the recommendations of the Department of Health and stay home when you're sick and self-isolate when you've tested positive or quarantine if you've come in contact with an individual who has tested positive for COVID-19. It's important to do this whether you're showing symptoms or not. Masking is also important to protect those around you. You may be mildly ill or asymptomatic and wearing a mask will reduce the risk and the likelihood that you may inadvertently pass the virus on to someone else. And that's all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mason. And uh, Christy will be available for questions. Uh, after we're done. Uh, next up is a behavioral health update. Prior to COVID-19 and of course uh, today, uh, the nation is uh, addressing a crisis of opioid addiction and overdose. Concerns continue to mount regarding the 
uh, impact and the loss of life caused by opioids. You know that you can save a life if someone is at risk, if you can identify the signs of overdose, and if you've also got Narcan available. Anyone uh, taking an opioid uh, can be at risk of overdose. Uh, individuals at highest risk includes those taking more than one opioid medication, people with a recent period of sobriety, uh, and, or if they were living clean and sober, or individuals discharged from treatment or incarceration, uh, because then a smaller dose can cause an overdose. Narcan is a medication that can be administered when someone experiences an overdose to save their life. The Behavioral Health Team has naloxone available for individuals at risk of overdose, for their family members, for friends, for businesses and nonprofits. Free two, free two dose Narcan kits are available through the Behavioral Health Department. Please visit behavioralhealth.nd.gov slash opioids or call the Behavioral Health Team member at 701-328-8920 and request a free kit. This medication is available because of a federal grant addressing op opioid overdose and prevention. 250 kits have been disseminated uh, since April 2020. Uh, North Dakota, law, North Dakota has laws that protect individuals that seek help for someone experiencing an overdose and also for those who administer naloxone to reduce an overdose. Those are called the Good Samaritan laws. So again, if you're with someone and they're overdosing, uh, you're protected, they're protected, uh, please call 911, get help, uh, and you'll be protected by those Good Samaritan laws. And, and, and of course, on uh, naloxone, if you're not familiar with it, uh, think of it almost like a nasal spray. It's just that simple. Uh, when you get the kits, you watch a short little video, and anybody can confidently deliver this and save a life. Uh, we know that most first responders and most public safety officials uh, across the state, uh, police and highway patrol, are carrying a Narcan. We thank them for them being on the front line of potentially saving lives. We know that addiction is a disease. Uh, it's not a moral failing, and we need to treat it like a disease, just like if it was a heart attack or something else. There's an opportunity to, to save a life if we could administer first aid through Narcan. Uh, the, and lastly, if you're someone out there who's listening or you know someone who's been struggling with an addiction through this entire time, uh, know that help is available, and there are many forms of effect of treatment. There are multiple roads to recovery. You're not alone. Recovery is possible. Uh, the opioid overdose resources are available at behavioralhealth.nd.gov slash opioids to help you identify signs of an overdose, steps to save a life during an overdose, identify those at risk of an overdose, and to learn more about the Good Samaritan and Naloxone Administration laws in North Dakota. And again, uh, something that we were pleased to announce last year, Recovery Reinvented, another great service uh, being provided by our great behavioral health team in North Dakota is Recovery Talk. At any point in time, if you want to have a confidential visit with someone who's a trained peer support specialist uh, from the state of North Dakota, who's got lived experience uh, in addiction, someone who understands the recovery journey, uh, call one 844 44 talk to 1 844 44 talk to, and you'll talk to somebody who's been in your shoes and walked your path. Uh, and that can be very helpful, proven to be super effective on helping people get to the road to recovery. So if you've never uh, done it again, completely anonymous, pick up the phone and call Recovery Talk and start your own path towards recovery. Next topic has to do with uh, what are called the SAFER grants. This is staffing for adequate fire emergency response. Uh, these are federal. Federal grants uh, provides funding directly to fire departments and volunteer firefighter interest organizations to assist in increasing the number of firefighters to help communities and to meet industry minimum standards and attain the 24-hour staffing to provide adequate protection from fire and fire-related ha hazards and to fulfill traditional missions of fire departments. Safer grants support projects in two areas. One is the hiring of firefighters to hire new additional firefighters to improve staffing levels or changing the status of part-time or paid on call to full-time. The second is grants uh, that allow for the recruitment and retention of volunteer firefighters to assist fire departments with the recruitment and retention who are involved in that. There's $350 million of funding that's come available. We were reminded of that again uh, by FEMA on our video conference with the Vice President 
Pence today and the uh, Coronavirus Task Force and the Safer Grant Program Notice of Funding Opportunity has been out for a while. There's no cost share to the applicant uh, and positions are fully funded to grant recipients. Uh, and again, when they're, you're building out uh, your capability, this can include base salary, standard benefits, uh, et cetera. Uh, but the deadline for this is coming right up tomorrow. The deadline, May 27th, 2020 at 4 p.m. Uh, you can find out more at gofema.gov. So if you're a volunteer or full-time firefighter organization in the state of North Dakota or a city official, uh, still time tonight uh, to get online, work on tomorrow, get your application in. I would want to say in the prior round, uh, there was two successful grantees. Uh, Belcourt received $498,000 and the uh, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, $265,000. So again, we've got a uh, track record of being able to win those significant grants for local fire departments. Again, safer grants deadline uh, tomorrow. Uh, under the good news uh, section, uh, we're looking back in history today. Many uh, exceptional North Dakotans have made a difference in the, in the world, leaving a legacy that shines a bright light on our state and uh, showing people what truly is legendary. And one of the uh, great honors uh, included in the role of being governor of North Dakota is the opportunity to uh, recognize those legendary North Dakotans with a Theodore Roosevelt Rough Rider Award like we did with Clint Hill uh, this last year. Uh, but uh, it's uh, the 100th anniversary today of Peggy Lee's birthday. And of course, Peggy Lee, who you know, uh, born in Jamestown, lived in Wimbledon, Nortonville, and Fargo. Uh, 45 years ago, Governor Art Link uh, and had her become the fifth inductee to the Theodore Roosevelt Rough Rider Hall of Fame. And of course, Peggy Lee uh, thir nominated for 13 Grammys, one Academy Award uh, and, uh, in 1975. Uh, she also uh, received an honorary doctorate from North Dakota State University. And as a young student, I had the honor of meeting Peggy Lee and giving her a dozen roses as part of her honorary doctorate. So a uh, fun personal memory, but a uh, fun 100 the anniversary of the birth of Peggy Lee. She passed away in 2002. Uh, Gratitude section. Uh, simple quote today comes from a 74 year old Australian writer, Rhonda Byrne. Uh, she says, Gratitude will shift you to a higher frequency and you will attract much better things. Uh, personally, know this certainly happens when you have an opportunity to pause and you have an opportunity to observe uh, with detail. You can increase your presence. It gives you a chance to just even take in a breath. It uh, can give you a moment to uh, understand uh, the, all the great things that may be going on in your life, whether it's your personal health, whether it's your relationships, uh, whether it's your connection with nature, or whether it's the fact that we as Americans are in living in the greatest country on the planet. Uh, so much to be grateful to to, to, for us to be, uh, but gratitude can help you shift to that higher frequency. Uh, so again, take a minute and uh, t take a moment and think about that and help it reset your frequency to a higher level. Uh, next up uh, is just an announcement about tomorrow before we go to Q&A. Um, tomorrow, for the first time in nearly a decade, NASA astronauts will be launched from U.S. soil in the SpaceX Demo-2 mission. This launch is an important step in the future of the U.S. space program. We know this will be an important moment in history. Uh, our thoughts and hopes will be with the NASA astronauts, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley, as they lead the Demo-2 mission in the final test flight of the Crew Dragon capsule. Currently, that launch is planned tomorrow for 3.30 uh, p.m. Central Time. We know that the weather is going to affect the launch and as of yesterday, the Air Force's 45th Space Wing was projecting only about a 40% per probability of launch. Uh, but if we uh, do find that the launch is going to happen, uh, then we'll be making a final decision about tomorrow's press conference around noon. We'll post more information. Uh, for right now, plan on being back here tomorrow at, at 3.30, uh, but uh, but stay stay tuned till noon because uh, if the launch is going to happen at the same time at 3.30 on schedule, then we would likely push our press conference back later in the day uh, tomorrow. Uh, and that concludes our remarks for today, and we'll move towards uh, Q&A. We'll go online first. Robin Travers, 660KYZ in Williston. With the numbers now coming down in Cass County and overall, are we any closer to beginning phase two in North Dakota? 
on? Well, we uh, certainly are going to take a look at that throughout this week, and we made, we've made some big moves each week in terms of loosening some more things up. I mean, a big one was going up to the uh, groups of up to 250. Uh, we, which we've already done, uh, we will certainly take a look at that. And again, relative to uh, want to get people to focus on what we're calling the threat levels. Uh, there's uh, this what we're calling the fire danger. We've got the five, the five colors and the the dial and the five uh, uh, five levels, and we're at the middle level at me level three right now. When we go to level two, uh, we've set the stage that we could do it statewide or we could do it uh, by county, and and we'll be taking a look at the numbers uh, by each individual county as well as by the state as we evaluate that and I'm certain we'll have more uh, to update by uh, Friday on that topic. And I should remember we have Dr. Mason here also for questions. We can go to Jacob. Uh, Governor, uh, just wondering if there's an update on the establishment of the private public partnerships to get up to 6,000 tests by June. Uh, I'm not sure if Christy heard that question. Uh, she uh, may or may not want to comment on that, but we 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 did do. A, I do know that the question was about a test uh, or private partner, private public test partnership, uh, but we did. Uh, develop a relationship with a national firm. Uh, they met our standard. We got results back in 33 hours on the test batch that we sent to them. And that uh, certainly seems promising uh, that, that that relationship could expand as another uh, sort of leg on the testing stool. Also this morning uh, on the call with the, the video conference with the, the, the Vice President and Dr. Burks and others, uh, they indicated that there was a substantial capacity that have uh, opened up uh, at the, the some of the national labs that were contracted earlier, Quest and LabCorp, uh, and specifically they were indicating that they thought that there was you know 50 to 100,000 tests a day kind of capacity that could be available there for states. Some states are taking advantage of that, uh, and so we'll uh, we'll. Uh, keep looking at these, but uh, the initial test that we had uh, with the test, and someone gave me the name of the name of the company and the location, I think it's in North Carolina, but again, the key the key for us is quality and turnaround time uh, that we're looking for if we're gonna be in a, in a relationship with a national, national source. Okay, going back online. Hannah Shirley with the Grand Forks Herald. How many nursing homes and long-term care facilities have had to retest residents after the apparent false positives? Um, and what is being done to address those false positives, particularly for those populations? Uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, maybe the second part of the question, Christy wants to come back. She may have to repeat that again on the what's being done to address false positives. But the breakdown of the 82 positives that we had across 15 counties and 27 providers, I don't have in front of me how many of those were actually either nursing home residents or or uh, staff. But perhaps uh, if Christy doesn't, maybe somebody else can find them. But uh, maybe Christy wants to answer the second part of the question. Dr. Mason. Yes, um, I believe the question was about what we're doing to prevent false positives in the future. Yep, particularly for populations in long-term care facilities. So when samples enter the laboratory, we actually do not treat them any differently. We treat everything as if they're high priority. We're actually trained early on to treat every patient or every sample that comes in as if it was a sample from our parents or our grandparents. So we treat every specimen the same. That helps ensure reproducibility and reliability. Um, so we don't do anything in, different in particular for long-term care facilities. But we have internal and external quality controls that we perform every day on every run to ensure that there is a minimal risk of having these false positives occur. It was actually the vigilance and the expertise of our laboratory personnel that was able to identify this. This was something that would have been really hard to catch. And it's an incredibly smart team that thought something was a little bit off. We did some checks, and then we, we lost confidence in the runs that actually worked well. And those are the ones that we went back and w investigated further, and those are the 82 that turned to be inconclusive. Um, these 82 tests are sort of a visible example of potential false positives. How often does this happen just in the normal course of your work? So normally, any time that something doesn't work right or QC fails, anything like that, we reject the run and we retest the specimen. Um, other inconclusive 
results will happen if I run a specimen and a run fails and there's no longer enough specimen to repeat that test. I don't know if it's positive or negative anymore. I attempted to run it and so we will report out an inconclusive result. That person retested. Yeah, then our recommendation, anytime we release an inconclusive result, our recommendation is to retest that individual. Uh, running to Dean Willis and Harold, what is the rate of false positives expected for this type of test if everything is done right? And how many false positives have we had? Um, it's really hard to identify a false positive. Um, it's inherently built into testing. So there's no way to go, you know what, you actually didn't have the disease, and that gets even harder to identify when you have a disease that's very asymptomatic, and because then a doctor can't go, you know what, I really don't believe that result. This looks like you have coronavirus. Everything tells me you have coronavirus, but the lab doesn't agree. They're saying it's positive or negative, whichever way. Um, and so it's done on the initial validation studies, but we strive for 100% sensitivity and specificity in all of the assays. Sure. But the, I'm just a little off topic. What's your current turnaround time for results? Um, anywhere between 24 and 48 hours once we receive the specimen. Um, do remember that it takes time for the specimens to travel around the state and get to our laboratory, but once we receive it, 24 to 48 hours. How, how's your staffing level? How many people are working at one time? And are you still working around the clock? Yeah, we're working around the clock. Um, the day shift, which is our highest volume, has the largest number of, number of employees. Um, it varies by day, depending on how many people are available to help us. But um, every day during the week, we typically have our original crew of 18 and the civil support team and other National Guard and Air Force members that are helping us. Thank you, Christy, and uh, uh, this might have been Jean's question uh, coming in now. The, the answer about how many of the 82 were at long-term care facilities, 35 of the 82 individuals were at 15 different long-term care facilities, and that 35 was broken down into seven residents and 28 uh, healthcare workers, and those 35 uh, were are all, as mine are saying, those 35 are all negative. Now they were part of that, the 82 false positives. Jeremy? This is sort of tangentially related to COVID, I guess, but um, <laughs> President Trump said again today that mail-in voting can lead to corruption, and he said that he would consider taking away federal funding from states that do mail-in voting. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that at this point. Well, I, I think in any voting process, there's a, uh, a a need for people to be very uh, thorough about making sure that people who uh, are of the right age, at the right geography, uh, and are eligible to vote, and that they only vote once. I mean, that's uh, that's been around since, I mean, democracies have begun. And I think that in North Dakota, we've got very good processes in place. Uh, as we know, we've had uh, 33 counties uh, prior to this had done primarily mail-in voting with the option for one uh, one physical location this year. Uh, the counties were given the ability to choose to not even have the one and go to, in during the primary, just a strict mail-in uh, mail situation. Uh, I, uh, the counties all have voted to do that. Uh, and I'm between our Secretary of State's office and local election officials in the counties, I have a good degree of confidence that everybody's making sure that, that, that we're hitting the target of getting ballots to uh, real North Dakotans with real addresses of the right age and they're voting in the right districts where they live. Uh, it's, you know, we're probably fortunate in a smaller state uh, where people, uh, fewer numbers of people and people have a better sense of knowing uh, who they are uh, to make sure that we wouldn't have sort of wide, widespread corruption. But I also think that there's, you know, be tools that can be applied. Uh, if you saw, we saw, we saw wide aberrations uh, coming in in terms of, um, say, a precinct that in the past uh, had a certain number of votes for the last 20 years and then they had some wildly different number of votes, uh, you'd probably want to say, hey, we should probably investigate that. And, and so 
some people might call it artificial intelligence or maybe just call it, uh, you know, exception reporting, but I think we've got to be, when we, we have to make sure that we've got the tools and the technologies to make sure that we're uh, making sure that if there's any sort of obvious abnormalities compared to past voting patterns that we're all on top of that because uh, democracy depends on people having confidence in their election system and and uh, there has been uh, you know additional dollars uh, provided by the feds there's uh, I think three million dollars that was came in as a grant that was passed by the emergency commission in the budget section that the uh, Secretary of State has available for uh, helping to conduct uh, elections during this time period and so we've got we got the resources and we have the experience and I think we should have the knowledge to make sure that we can make sure we've got safe clean elections here in North Dakota follow up very quickly. Um, in your mind, there would be no reason to doubt the outcome of the primary elections, right? Well, they haven't happened yet. So if we had a, I mean, if you had a precinct that, you know, came in and had three times as many votes as it ever had in history, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, sometimes you don't know till after the fact if if there would be a reason to cause, that, might, that might raise doubt uh, that would cause someone to uh, take a look. But... <clears throat> Right now, right now, I've got good confidence that we're on a good, good trajectory right now. Jacob, uh, going off of that, as a part of the mail-in ballot, uh, voters have to buy a stamp for it. Some have called this a poll tax, which is unconstitutional. Do you believe this is a poll tax? Um, the there is an opportunity for uh, for someone to uh, drop off their ballot at a box without putting a stamp on it. And to the degree that if a, uh, I guess maybe with a super low historic gasoline prices, and if someone had no value on their time, uh, then maybe the stamp costs more than their own time and the gasoline to drive to the poll and wait in line to vote. Uh, but there's, co there's cost to voting in person, and there's cost to voting online. Uh, I guess an alternative would be uh, to uh, think about whether or not we should provide, uh, you know, return envelopes prepaid uh, as part of that process would be uh, something I guess maybe the legislature could look at if people thought that was a concern. But again, I, I will, I know that there are uh, locations posted uh, online about where the drop boxes are, where people can drop their ballots. <clears throat> okay, we'll go back to uh, online. <clears throat> Gene Shemp, Hometown Radio Group in Minot and Botnell. Currently, the CDC says an asymptomatic person who tests positive and remains asymptomatic following that test uh, for 10 days can be classified as recovered. Uh, if they never develop symptoms, how can the state be sure that they are not still contagious without a negative test? To uh, the Again, if we had an epidemiologist here, uh, maybe they could answer this. I don't know if Christy wants to try to answer this one. I will just take the first stab at it. But uh, I've asked the same question, Gene, about recovered in the 10-day period. And my understanding is that the after a person has tested positive and if they're asymptomatic for 10 days and you test them again, uh, the possibility of having enough uh, viral load to come up with a po positive test is is very low uh, and so that you could, uh, you know, burn a lot of testing resources trying to confirm this, but the, uh, you know, person develops the antibodies, they're not sick, they're not consuming any healthcare, uh, they're, you know, they're not consuming any healthcare uh, capacity, which is again, the thing we're really trying to manage. And so I, I think that they, it was longer initially, I think the CDC had it at 14 days, they lowered it to 10. And, and obviously they've done that on a lot of data, on a lot of testing, on a lot of people to come up with that standard. So that's how I believe we got to where we are on the 10 day piece. But uh, Christy, anything you wanna to add to that? I can okay. <clears throat> So with PCR tests, we actually are looking at the viral RNA and we don't know if the virus is alive or dead. And so you'll have this shedding that can happen afterwards, even though they're not infectious. And so studies have shown that after I believe nine days, um, they're having trouble or they're not getting the virus to grow in culture, which means it's no longer viable, but they may still be shedding viral parts and have a positive PCR test. So a positive PCR test doesn't necessarily tell you a patient's ability to infect another person.
So the key definition there of recovered is is the understanding that they're not in a position to infect somebody else, which is uh, what we're really trying to manage is slowing the spread of infection, which is why we've got the uh, uh, the ten day recovered in the quarantine rules. Dave. Word from the task force and the long-term care association that's working on perhaps new procedures to allow families to visit their loved ones who are in long-term care facilities? Uh, I believe last week when uh, Chris Jones was here, we said we have an update this week, so we'll look forward to hearing that this week. Online. Scott Hennan, WZFG KFYR Radio. As the next phases of reopening are considered, what role will the county by county numbers play in allowing restrictions to be lifted in counties with low case counts? Well, there'll be, uh, for Scott, one of the questions uh, that will, one of the factors that we'll look at on reopening uh, is going to be county by county numbers. We're going to look at it as a state. We're going to look at adjacent counties uh, because we know that the virus doesn't know where the county lines are. It doesn't know where state lines are. So it's a little bit about the county and those other counties surrounding it. Uh, so we'll take a look at all that. It, it can also look at, we could look at population density, uh, you know, uh, you know, obviously, and we've got some very rural, low population counties that are that are by by nature doing more uh, physical distancing than some of our uh, higher density metro areas. So we'll try to take a look at all of those. And there's going to be uh, uh, some art, some science, uh, some math, some statistics, and just some good judgment, some on the ground uh, sense of how people are doing. And if we make a decision on whether we do it on a state, an entire state to the level two or whether we do it a combination of, uh, of counties uh, that may go forward or not to the next level of reopening. Okay, things are slowing down. Uh, we had a little bit of a lighter show today. We got plenty of other topics coming up this week, uh, but I wanna thank everybody for being here today. And uh, we'll uh, look forward to uh, giving you an update tomorrow at noon about what time, uh, whether or not we're going ahead at 3.30, whether we're launching at 3.30 or whether the, the new the spacecraft is launching at 3.30. Okay, thank you all. See you tomorrow one way or the other. And thank you, Dr. Mason. Thank you.